I'd like to show you one last thing from circular motion. Now we've been looking at all sorts of examples of uh, what circular motion is and going around in a circle, and we learned that the centripetal force, in other words the center seeking force, was equal to the mass times the velocity squared over r. Now what I'd like to show you though is something with orbits. This is kind of cool. We can already start dealing with orbital mechanics just by this and using one other rule. So it turns out um, that gravitation, or you know gravity, causes a, uh, well let's say a centripetal acceleration. So it turns out this can happen. So let's say you've got um, the Earth here. And you want to go out in orbit. So you know, let's say you're going out here and you're going in orbit like this right here. Well, I mean, you're going in orbit, and yes, you're feeling a downwards force, but you're also going forward. And it turns out then you're always sort of feeling this downwards force as you're doing it. So this gravity can cause a centripetal um, acceleration because you're going in a circle, and that means, and therefore, a force. So you could say then that this you know, downwards gravitational force is equal to some sort of centripetal force. So these are the two equations you need. Now this first one you may not have seen before, maybe you have, it's actually called Universal Law of Gravitation. It's Newton's Law. So it's uh, Newton's Universal Law of Gravitation. And it says that the gravitational force of attraction between any two objects is equal to this capital G, which by the way that's just a constant. So maybe I'll actually define this here. This one right here, so Fg equals the gravitational force, which is measured in Newtons. We've got G, which is just a constant. Now it's equal to roughly 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Um, then we've got, well, M and m are just the mass. Now it's the mass of the uh, either the small little thing going around like the satellite and then the big m would be the mass of the earth. It could be whatever you're looking at and r is the orbital radius which is normally measured in meters. So this is what we would normally use. Now it turns out though that if you're going around in a circle, well you also have this centripetal force, which we just learned about here. The centripetal force is mv squared over r. So I'll say but fg equals fc. This is the key thing here. So fc equals mv squared over r. So because of that, because these two are equal to each other, because, see, the gravitational force is, is the same as the centripetal force, then we can say then that G M M over R squared, that's FG here, that's a gravitational force, is equal to um, M V squared over R. That's kind of nice. And then what we can do then is we can see, well, the little m's cancel out. See, the mass of the small object, that cancels out. In other words, all that matters is the mass of the planet, in this case, Earth, or mass of whatever is big. So now we have that going on, and we can just then get, uh, well, we can get v squared by itself. So we could actually say then that, uh, well, let me just rearrange it. So I'll say v squared over r equals g m over r squared. I'm just, I'm just moving this thing to the left, moving this thing to the right. I'm basically just flipping this. And that means then I could say that, uh, well, v squared is going to be, let's see, I'll move this r up here, so I'll have g times m, and r up here will cancel out the r down here. If you're not sure, let's do it. So you have this r right here cancels out that one. So then I can say then that v is going to equal the square root of g m over r. In other words, my orbital speed will be equal to this constant, just this number, times the mass of the planet, divided by your orbital radius. And that's how it works. Turns out, by the way, that if you keep going a little bit further, if you actually leave this right here, and if you just replace v with, uh, what could you do, the distance traveled, so 2 pi r over the period, turns out if you just take this and replace it into here, you can actually uh, derive Kepler's third law, which talks about uh, how the period and the orbital radius are related. But that's not time to do that yet. We can always do that later.
The key thing, you know, is that the orbital speed will just be the square root of this constant, this, just, this is just a number, times the mass of whatever you're orbiting, divided by the orbital radius. That'll be your orbital speed. Now this can then be useful, because what if we're asked something like this? So how fast do you need to go in order to be in an orbit of 36,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface? And then here we're going to, so here what we're doing, um, we're going to do something like this here. So in other words, you're, you're trying to orbit around like this. Now keep in mind though, that here we have to look at the center of mass of the object. So this right here, this is the key thing we're looking at here. This is, you know, this is your radius here, this right here. So we're told, uh, first of all, that we have an orbit of 36,000 kilometers above the surface. So we know that this distance from here to here is 36,000 kilometers. But we're also told that the radius of the Earth, that's 6,378 kilometers. So that's important because we have to know the total distance we are from the center. And then of course we have the mass. So we can actually easily calculate this. We're going to use the same equation that the V is just square root of G times M over R. It's that easy. Except, well, actually, let's start doing it. So we've got G, which is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. We're going to do that times the mass of the Earth, which is approximately uh, 6 times 10 to the 24 meter, uh, kilograms. Sorry. Divide that by, now this is really important to consider this though. We have to do these, well let's do them in kilometers first. So we'll say it has to be this plus this. So we'll say 6378 plus 36,000. Now this is in kilometers. I have to put this in meters. So how many uh, meters are in a kilometer? There's a thousand. So if I have this many kilometers, I have to have that times a thousand to get me how many meters it was and do the square root. That's the key thing, first of all, is this one right here. We had to add these up. That was the key thing going on. And so was this. That's because it's 1,000 meters in one kilometer. That's, sort of, that's where that 1,000 came from. And we had to add these because we had to consider the total distance from the center. Well, now it's just a matter of using our calculator. So I'm going to clear this and do this. All right. so. I need to just put in these numbers here. Now these, it might seem complicated, so I'll just take my time with it. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. I'll just say enter. I'll say that times 5.98 times 10 to the power of 24, I want. Enter. Now, if I'm not sure, I mean, I'm, I'm worried about, you know, messing something up. So what I'm going to do is I can always just store that as a, a letter A if I want. I mean, that's just one way of doing it. Now, of course, I'm going to deal with the bottom part separately. So I'm going to say 6378 plus 36,000. Say it's equal to that. And I'll do that times 1,000. Then I'll say, fine, then I want A divided by this value that I just found. Because that's, that's this divided by all this. I get that. I take the square root of the answer, and I get this. So I get 3,067 meters per second. So I'll say that means it's roughly, well, 3,000. So V is roughly 3,000. Um, meters per second, which means my velocity is around three kilometers per second. That is really fast. I mean, just think about it. In one second, it goes about three kilometers. Now, you might think, is there anything actually in orbit at 36,000 kilometers? Absolutely. Turns out this is very close to a very, very special and sort of magic number. And it turns out, remember I alluded to this before when I said you could have actually taken this same equation and replaced it with 2 pi r over t. Turns out because velocity is a distance over time. When you go around in a circle, then you go around, you know, the circumference of a circle. So that's 2 pi r, that's the circumference of a circle, divided by the time it takes you to orbit. We call that your orbital period. That's the little t here. 
And it turns out that this is a very, very special thing here. It turns out that at that exact distance that we were just looking at, your orbital period will be the same as the Earth's for turning around. Which means if you line this thing up correctly like this, we call this orbit right here a, a geosynchronous orbit. Sometimes it's actually called, uh, so we'll actually call it geosynchronous orbit. And in terms of uh, rocket science, what we actually we call this, we call this geo, just for short. Whoops, I actually spelled it wrong. We actually call it geo. By the way, we call LEO, that's low Earth orbit. GEO means geosynchronous orbit. What this means is, if you're up at that altitude, what happens is you're going around the Earth. You know, it takes you around 24 hours to go around the Earth. And if you're lined up in the correct way, that means then as the Earth itself spins around on its axis, you know, in 24 hours, and you're also going around in 24 hours, that means then that you'll be over the same point on the Earth all the time. So it's going to look like you're just floating right above. Of course you're not. I mean, you happen to be spinning around, but you're going at the exact same speed that the Earth rotates. Now, geosynchronous orbit is great then for um, things like uh, communication satellites, because you're basically always having a satellite parked right above you. But there is some good and the bad for it. The good is that, I mean, it, it, it works for, uh, well, this is really clever, I think, and it's really handy. The bad is it only works around the equator. So which means, what if you want to, uh, I mean, this was the case even for spy satellites. If you want to sort of spy on someone and sort of take lots of pictures of them, there's a problem. First of all, you're really far away. So being really far away means you need extra big zoom lens to see stuff. So that's a problem. But the other problem is you're only parked over the equator, which means if you want to see something up at the pole here, it's a lot harder to see. So maybe you need to have a really weird orbit. It turns out there's some really clever orbits that even the Russians have figured out, things like a Molnia orbit. So those are things that actually sort of zip down here and then go up, and then zip down and go up. And it turns out it goes faster when it's down here, slower when it's up here. But the cool thing is, over that time, though, the Earth spins around while you're going up. So technically, you can see everything on Earth from that orbit. The only problem is your speed changes a lot. So sometimes you're really close, sometimes you're really far. Sometimes you're going really fast, sometimes you're going really slow. So in orbital mechanics, there's a lot of different things to keep in mind. But if you want a satellite parked right over you, let's say for a satellite, um, let's say for, I don't know, GPS even, or, or for something like uh, for communications, it is pretty handy to have something that's just sitting right above you. So that's why this is actually a very special orbit. That's just why I gave you this, just for fun to play with. It's not exactly 36,000 kilometers, but it's very, very close. So that's kind of a neat thing that we can actually use what we just learned with circles, you know, circular motion, to explain about orbits, to rederive Kepler's laws, it turns out, to figure out geosynchronous orbits. It tells us why we, we feel uh, like we're being squished when we're in a centrifuge, and it explains, obviously, why uh, we're going in the center, even though it may not seem obvious. I think this centripetal force is, is not at all an obvious thing. I think a lot of students really struggle with it, and rightly so. It seems really weird that you're accelerating towards the center. You're like, I don't feel that. Not exactly. You don't, you don't feel it. It turns out you feel what we call the centrifugal force, right? Because it goes in, and you want to keep going straight, so you feel squished on the opposite side. But in any case, that's a quick overview of uniform circular motion.